Hey everyone, welcome to the Redefining HR podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I'm really excited to be sitting down with the Chief People Officer and Head of Corporate Affairs for the Lego Group, Lauren I. Schuster. Uh, Lauren and I are going to talk about his career path leading into Lego. He actually came into the field of HR from outside of the field. We're going to talk about that, and we're really going to spend a lot of time digging into the Lego Group's culture and people operations and so much more. So, Lauren, thanks so much for making time to come on the show. If you wouldn't mind, why don't you just start with a brief uh, introduction and background on you? Yeah, fantastic. Well, first of all, Lars, thanks for your interest in in my story and maybe more importantly, uh, the Lego Group story. Hopefully I could give a little bit of insights what goes on inside uh, the Lego Group. And uh, so a bit of background on me, born and bred in Montreal in Canada, always ha- aspire to, to kind of build my life outside of the community uh, that I grew up in, left Canada in 1992 and kind of haven't been back since. So I kind of ran away from home and have been living and working in 11 different countries uh, over those years. Spent the majority of my career up until four years ago in commercial leadership roles, in marketing leadership roles, general management, huge chunk of time out in, in Asia, which is uh, fantastic. Married to a, a Malaysian Chinese woman. Uh, two boys, uh, 15 and 17, who uh, had their fair share of uh, Lego building experiences and endless sets at home and joined the Lego group seven uh, years ago, just approaching seven years as the chief commercial officer and then transitioned to the chief people officer and the head of corporate affairs uh, four years ago and happy to share that story as well. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that because I think if you if you look at the profile of chief people officers today, they do tend to be very, uh, or, or at times I should say, you know, nonlinear. Whereas traditionally, uh, in more legacy oriented HR groups, you know, that leader typically came from within HR, and now you're seeing more examples like yours of people moving into that role from other areas of the business. So for you, what was that transition like? You know, four years ago, you were already at the Lego Group. Uh, you came in in a commercial role. Now you're being tapped to move into a role that is very different from your, uh, you know, experience and career path up until that point. So walk me through that that transition. H- how did that take place? Yeah, no, happy to share that, Lars. Well, well it's actually it's it's kind of a 20 year journey that that, uh, <laughs> that that took me into the HR role. I'll give you the short version of the story, uh, obviously. But it was really in the late 90s when I was 29 that I ended up uh, kind of by chance at a holistic health retreat in Australia. And that was the first time I was exposed to so-called different modalities of wellness and human potential, the human potential movement. So yoga, mindfulness, counseling, group work. And that kind of wedged my mind open to ways of developing uh, self-awareness as well as social and cultural awareness that I simply didn't have or understand before. And that led me on a path of discovery of personal development. Then I, I brought that more into how how can I, as, a, as, as I became more self-aware, how can I become a better leader? How can I interact and engage people better? How can I build followership? How can I have a, a more positive impact on the organizations I've operated in? And that led to an interest in coaching and I have some coaching cert- certification into mindfulness and mindfulness in the corporate space, as well as leadership. And, and it eventually led me to go back to school, uh, which I did while I was at, at Google, uh, to do a degree in organizational psychology. And that was in addition to, you know, have a master's, uh, an MBA, which I did in, in 1995, so a, lot, a long time ago. So it, it was a series of events and learnings and development that ultimately stoked my interest to take the seat as the chief people officer and to try and have a positive impact on the business from that seat versus uh, the the general management or commercial seats that I had before. Yeah, so you know, as a as a business leader in a range of companies prior to the Lego Group, um, obviously you interacted with HR and the people team. You you had a a perspective on the team from a um, from a, a customer of theirs, so to speak. Uh, and then obviously when you're running the team you now have a very different perspective Mm. because now you're kind of inside the group. You see things firsthand. 
what maybe surprised you in, in that transition? You know, as somebody who had kind of been working with uh, HR kind of as a, as a partner to somebody now driving mm. that function. Yeah, I think uh, that, well, first of all, as you know, Lars, uh, I mean, everyone has a point of view on what <laughs> HR should be doing or shouldn't be doing and what the ex employee experience should be or shouldn't be and what the comp and bends should and shouldn't be in talent development and so on and so forth. So I was one of those uh, one of those uh, critique uh, um, uh, from the sidelines. Uh, so it is very different when you when you lead the function. And I think that's true any time you take another seat at any leadership table, uh, you see the business from a different angle and every function uh, is equally imperative to making a business uh, thrive in a sustainable way. But I think one of the things that surprised me, which, which may sound a little bit benign, but I think there was, there's something deeper to it, which is, you know, when you come from the business and, and I was running also a, a, a retail business at the Lego Group, a direct to consumer business. But when you're running a, a, a consumer orientated business, your 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 feedback loops are, are literally hourly, daily, weekly. I mean, you're putting something out in the market. It could be a campaign. It could be a product. Uh, and as everything digitalizes and goes online, you're getting feedback from the market immediately and you're having to react and respond to it to compete effectively. So that that's just the, the paradigm that uh, most commercial businesses, consumer orientated, would, would operate in. But when you go into the HR function, at least what I found is you enter a paradigm and it's evolving, of course, and I'm oversimplifying, but it's a paradigm or has been a paradigm of deeply institutionalized annual processes and which are just completely out of sync with how the business is operating, with how different individuals in the business are learning and growing and, and the type of feedback that they need internally. So I think that's what surprised me the most. And I think what surprised my team when I when I joined was my I didn't I didn't necessarily think about it. It was just how I was wired was just that the if we decided to do something, the expectation would be, OK, well, when can I see the first version of that next week? And, and they'd be, oh, well, what do you mean? Maybe we could do something next next year. So I think that's uh, one of the paradigms that I've been really trying to to break down. Uh, and I think we have been breaking it down at the Lego group. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit, because I think, you know, you're right from a commercial perspective, um, the the time cycles are so much more rapid um, than typically in traditional HR time cycles, which is, you know, let's let's build a business case. Let's, uh, you know, pilot it. Let's roll it out to a broader group. Let's iterate. Let, and, you know, by the time you roll something out, it could be a year later and you're rolling it out to a different real, you know, environment than you created it for. And so I think one of the shifts that's happening in HR right now is just this um, this this velocity towards output. Um, you know, our ability to kind of move away from playbooks around how you know set ways of thinking on how we do things to much more agile and and adaptive practices. So how did that kind of that commercial mindset in your experience? You mentioned you're kind of now bringing that into HR. What does that look like in practice for you and, and for your teams? Yeah, and, and a lot of things you're, you're speaking about are, is, is our reality as well, because, you know, most businesses are pursuing a more agile approach, some in a very formalized manner and setting up product teams and have agile coaches and running scrums and so, so on and so, so forth. And we're doing the same. And it's interesting that that's a cultural change for a business. And very often a, HR should be the catalyzers of cultural change, of mindset change, of capability building, of talent development to enable that. So if, if, if your goal and your purpose is to develop the capabilities for the future in the organization, and those are capabilities around agile testing and learning, you know, value and output on a regular basis, then you need to be able to practice that uh, on your own. So just as an example, as the Lego group is going through our own digital transformation, as many other organizations, we're eating our own dog food in in the HR organization. We call ourselves People Operations and Development, so P-O-N-D. But in, in our HR organization, we've set up uh, three product teams 
And we're trying very much to practice what we preach so that the capability building programs that we're responsible to bring into the organization to elevate, uh, whether it's the digital uh, team themselves or whether that's the product development team or the operations team, that we can speak from a place of expertise from having, uh, yeah, eaten our own dog food, so to speak. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think, you know, especially having a background like yours that is, um, you know, has been obviously commercially focused, um, but also very focused in kind of things like branding and, and marketing. And, you know, the branding and marketing as a skill set within HR is relatively new. I think, you know, as we look at the current digital iteration of employer branding, you know, most organizations do have, are thinking about employer brand as they're designing their recruiting and talent strategy. Um, but even branding internally for HR and people programs, right? Like branding as a skill set isn't typically embedded inside of HR. And so I'm curious, like, especially as you look at, you know, mirroring some of the uh, product focuses of, of the business within your team, what role does kind of building that, um, that branding uh, mindset and kind of capability and how you roll these programs out um, enter your approach? No, I, I mean, it's, it's huge. And I think that's a, it's a, another good call out. It, it's interesting because so many of the things that have been practiced, whether it's in the marketing uh, function or in the sales function, whether that's the sales or the marketing tech stacks, or whether that's, uh, you know, branding or the consumer and shopper experience, those are very similar to the employee experience, employer branding, exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so one thing we try and do is they actually bring some of that talent into uh, the HR organization. But so much of what HR does is around uh, both internal and external communications. There's an internal branding effort for literally each and every initiative that is launched in the organization to get the buy-in of the, I mean, we have over 20,000 colleagues in the organization and three different groups. We've got hourly production, we've got uh, Lego retail associates, uh, and then we have salaried. I mean, you need to be, be able to speak to different audiences in a language and a tonality that is relevant and meaningful to them. And, and I mean, the exact same thing could be said about your consumer audiences. So, so many of the practices that at least I grew up learning as a marketing professional or a commercial pro, uh, professional um, are very well suited into the HR space. And maybe if I give you one very concrete example, we went uh, about uh, redesigning our leadership model, and which could often be, uh, I think, sometimes somewhat dry, somewhat uh, corporate -y. And, you know, we had a diverse group of colleagues uh, design this and package it and name it, and you know they gave it the name, or we have the, the name of our leadership model is the Leadership Playground, which is obviously a brand that is befitting of the Lego group and what we stand for. So I think these are just some examples of how we try and adopt uh, some of the, the branding principles or commercial principles of the business into what we do as HR. And I think most uh, viewers and listeners are familiar with uh, the Lego group and certainly familiar with Legos, have played with Legos, have stepped on Legos, all, all of the you know, aspects of how Legos are, are part of our lives. But I imagine many may not be familiar with the culture um, mm. at the Lego group. So I'd love to learn more about that. Like, how, how do you describe the, the culture at the Lego group? You mentioned 20,000 employees spread across three product lines. Um, how does that come together? What are what are some of the kind of uh, you know unifying traits and qualities mm. of the culture there? Yeah, well, uh, well, I think for any organization's culture, you need to look at its its history and mm. its its origins. Uh, similar to any any cultural group uh, or family, and the Lego Group. Uh, I don't know if all all of our listeners and viewers would know this, but is about to turn ninety years old next year. And it's a privately held company. The same owners, uh, fourth generation owners, own the company uh, over 90 years. Uh, and it's a Northern European company. We're headquartered in Billund in Denmark, which is the western part of, of Denmark. So, th so the fact that it's private, that it's a company that is anchored in Denmark, that creates a certain cultural context 
uh, for us. And from that perspective, we're a very, very collaborative, collectivist, um, people oriented business as, you know, many people would maybe suspect knowing something about Northern European culture and, and society. Uh, then, of course, uh, you know, our main purpose is to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow, to inspire and develop children uh, through creative play experiences and learning through play. So that creates an environment of creativity, of innovation, uh, of fun. Uh, you know, when I before I joined the Lego group, I kind of had this fantasy that it was going to be like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And and there's definitely elements of that. If you have the privilege of walking through our um, our where our innovation teams and our designers uh, are headquartered and, and they're all pretty much based in in Billen. Uh, it's just remarkable the amount of creativity and fun and innovation uh, that is going on in the organization and is embedded in our culture. And maybe the last thing I would say that I think is quite unique is that we we truly look at the, the business holistically. So we're very results orientated, but for us, results are not only financial results. And I know a lot of organizations say this, but I'll, I'll call out a distinction here. But we have four promises. We have our people promise, our play promise, our partner promise, and our planet promise. And, and each of those has a, what we call a pinnacle KPI associated with it. And each of those KPIs are consequential. So, so yes, com consumer sales and profit play a role in how we get remunerated uh, on a short-term and long-term basis, but almost at an equal level is our employee motivation and satisfaction, is our customer satisfaction, is the net promoter score of our products. So those have consequences on our remuneration. And we believe that we need to be committing to all these promises for the business to be successful in a sustainable way moving forward. So that creates a unique cultural context, which is quite unique and different than other organizations I've been in, because it's much more balanced in terms of uh, appreciating what it takes to succeed in a sustainable way. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I think it, uh, I can see how that uh, kind of anchors your values too as, as a business that help inform and shape the culture um, when you kind of have clarity uh, towards each of those four areas. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when, you look at, when you look at your role, obviously you came into the chief people officer role four years ago. You've walked through some of the change and transformation that you've been leading since, um, you know, and then now kind of fast forward to the last 18 months, almost two years, we're in this kind of radically different environment with um, the pandemic, but it's not just the pandemic. Like I think the pandemic accelerated a lot of these conversations that we used to call future of work things, and now they're just today. Uh, but it, it's it's from the pandemic, it's from flexible work, it's remote and hybrid work, it's it's having different conversations around social justice and DEI and uh, you know equity within our organizations. There's so many things that have that have shifted the nature of work itself that uh, that really all kind of come back to your world in in people operations. And so, I'm curious for you. You're you're, you're operating at scale with 20,000 employees. How do you think about kind of pri you know processing those external factors and then you know prioritizing your innovation roadmap uh, for the people team, kind of based on those when when you're operating add a size and scale that obviously you can't do everything all at once. So you do have to kind of sequence and prioritize that. How do you approach that? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a big, that's a big question. And you call out, I mean, really the pressure cooker that, uh, you know, not just the Lego group, but pretty much all organizations uh, have been under and are under now. There's just so much dramatic change uh, happening in the world today. Uh, obviously, the pandemic is, is one overriding factor, but you call out, uh, you know, digitalization. Uh, you didn't call out, but it's a big factor is sustainability and the climate agenda, the social justice. And 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 it, it almost feels as if it's coming one thing on top of the other. And that's creating a huge amount, even outside of work, just as individuals, as human beings, uh, living on this planet, uh, that's creating a lot of stress and intensity. 
And then you combine it with, uh, we're fortunate that for us, our business has uh, been thriving at an incredible level the, the, the last few years. And there's been incredible demand for our product, which we're very grateful for. But keeping up with that demand in these conditions has created a lot of uh, stress on the system as well. So I think what's been super important for us are, you know, some are the, the traditional things of just being super clear about what our priorities are and communicating them very effectively and staying the course and delivering. And, you know, we have a very clear strategy and we're executing on that, uh, whether that's our sustainability strategy uh, to, for example, we made a commitment by 2025 to uh, remove all single use plastic from our, our, our packaging. So we're committed to that and we're executing that. Uh, or if it's to, uh, increase our share amongst uh, the girls' audience in, in the market. So, so we have business strategies, and then in HR, the, the same thing. We've got our priorities. We've been very focused on modernizing the function uh, through technology. We're deploying new HR uh, technology stack, uh, which includes everything from a core platform to uh, more robust analytical tools. And then that enables us to build the capabilities within HR that kind of prepare us for the future, which is a much more data-driven function. Having said all that, I think the lesson that we've learned as a, an HR function within the Lego group, but I think it's true beyond, is just how important well-being and, and empathy are in, in this mix, uh, because it's just so critical when everyone is under so much pressure due to all these factors that, that we've been discussing everyone needs an opportunity to to be heard and to be understood. And I love the expression that uh, one of my teachers uh, shared with me, which is that, you know, we're, we're all in the same storm, but in different boats. And I think that's just so important for not just HR, but uh, HR can catalyze it within the organization to signal to each and every colleague that, we respect your individual boat, your individual situation. Please let us know about it. Let us understand your situation so that we could then try and create the context for you to thrive to the best of your ability, given the conditions that, that you're facing. Uh, so well-being, uh, and then there's some formal well-being interventions that we've been um, bringing to the forefront and starting to invest in uh, everything from, you know, mindfulness programs to to peer coaching and peer support groups uh, to mental wellness, uh, which is obviously a critical issue, mental wellness support. And, and that's only going to become more important moving forward. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think that the uh, the complexity of people operations just continues to expand. Um, and there's so many things that are, you know, today, when you look at best in class people teams, they're in the scope of what we're thinking about that, that weren't even on our radar five years ago. And so it's just exciting to see how that continues to evolve. Um, and, and the, and the, you know, the, the compounding importance of having really kind of progressive, um, you know, leaders, uh, but also programs and practices on the people team to help, businesses and employees thrive. Um, as I look around your office, uh, no, no surprise, I see a lot of, uh, of Lego set up. Oh, that's um, right. How many do you have? And uh, what is your favorite piece? Oh, I, I don't know how many I have, but you could see it's, all, it's almost like a store. So it's re I'm really, really fortunate <laughs> that all the novelties, so the Lego group, I mean, people talk about our innovation machine, but we launch about 60 to 70% of all our, of our products in any year are new in that year. So there's a very high level of innovation and novelty. So they get shipped to my house. So, so probably 500 boxes uh, a year. But one of my favorites is, well, actually two are right here, which is one is the Coliseum. Uh, and this is one of the largest sets that we produce. It's a, I think it's a, just about 9,000 uh, pieces, which is really rem remarkable. And, and then a much smaller set, but one that is uh, very meaningful to me and I think meaningful to you because I see it over your right shoulder, which is the Everyone is Awesome set, which was our celebration of different identities 
And uh, that's something that is very important to the Lego group, both as a employer, uh, but also as a brand, because we know that children are not born with any preconceived notion of one race or one identity being right or wrong or better or worse. And, uh, you know, that's something that we would like to definitely raise the flag on. Well, uh, Lord, it's been great learning more about your your background, your path, your career. Um, before we get to lightning round, I just one more question for you. When you think about, we've talked about all the changes that's been happening over the last couple of years and kind of the direction of the field. When you think about the kind of trajectory and the direction for people operations and uh, and you know what some still call HR, what some no longer mm. call HR, but the, the field more broadly. Um, what gives, what gives you hope? What gets you most excited when you think about uh, where we're heading? Oh, well, there's a lot I get excited about. I, th I think for, for there's never been a better time to be in HR. And, you know, one of the positive outcomes, of course, I would, would not wish that the pandemic, I would wish that the pandemic didn't happen, of course. But the fact that it did has, has really highlighted the criticality of the HR role uh, in supporting the overall well-being of the business uh, and of individuals to to be their best selves and to be able to contribute and have a meaningful impact on the world. So I think there's no better time to be in HR. When I look moving forward as someone who's been in technology for a, a large part of my career, it's just great to see how much money is is flowing into HR technology and how much richer the function is getting at uh, and more sophisticated at leveraging data to make evidence-based decisions. Because I think a criticism of HR over the years has been that it's not science-based, it's not data-driven, it's all, it's intuitive, it's, it's the soft stuff. And I, I think that's just absolutely untrue, especially with the tools available today uh, where we could now start having a much clearer line of sight of the HR programs and interventions and line of sight to business outcomes for either consumers, for shoppers, or for other stakeholders. And that's what gets me most excited. Yeah, it's an exciting time. And I mean, you called out the amount of uh, venture capital being poured into WorkTech specifically. I mean, we're breaking records. Every quarter mm. we're breaking records this year. This is going to be a, a year like nothing we've experienced on the WorkTech uh, VC side. So it'll be fascinating to see what comes from that. Um, Lord, I really appreciate you sharing your career journey and your story and your work at the Lego Group with us. Uh, we close every episode with a lightning round of kind of rapid fire questions just to help mm. the viewers and listeners get to know you a little bit better. So are you ready for that? Go for it. All right. So music plays a big role in the, the Amplify ecosystem. And if I'm checking out your Spotify playlist, uh, who will I learn are your top three artists? Yep. Well, um, the latest top three are Ziggy Marley, uh, mm -hmm. which I just find the best way to start every weekend. Incognito, which is kind of an acid jazz uh, band, which some people may know I may be aging myself. And I'll cheat a little bit because the third one is is not actually a, a an artist, but is uh, The Daily, the New York Times podcast, which is yep. something that I listen to every morning just to get the, the background on what's going on in the world. Uh, what is your least favorite HR buzzword? Oh, probably work-life balance. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I, th I think it's just outdated and a misconstruction of how we live our lives today in the modern world. Um, okay, so I know you've had a couple careers already. Usually this question is, if you weren't working in HR, what would you be doing? I'm also going to take commercial roles off the table for you. You can't revert ah, back to a former no. career. So you can't do either of those things. What would you be doing? Well, I could share my my fantasy, which is kind of semi-retirement in Whistler, British Columbia, skiing and hiking and mountain biking half my time, and then uh, coaching and advising and potentially even uh, teaching uh, a university course on organizational psychology. Okay. You know, you afraid that as a fantasy. I think that's attainable. Well, I think, I, uh, I'm trying I, to I, manifest I it. I'm trying to manifest it. Uh, and last question for you, Lauren, uh, who is one uh, HR people leader who you admire and why? Oh, that, that's a tough one. There, there's so many. And when I, you know, one thing about being new to the function, when I, four years ago, when I took over, I must have engaged with 
30, 40 CHROs. And I was just calling everyone, trying to learn as much as I, I could. And they've all been super helpful. But if I needed to, to name one, uh, it'd probably be, he'd probably be surprised that I even uh, call him out. But Yuha Akras, who was the first HR uh, leader, this was way back at Nokia, probably 15 years ago. But he was the first HR leader I met who didn't come from HR. He spent his whole life in the business. And that's created a huge impression on me that, oh, this is interesting. You could do that role without growing up in the function and potentially be even more effective. So I think that's inspired me. Yeah. Well, Lauren, I really appreciate you coming on the show, sharing your career journey and story and giving us an inside look into your work at the Lego Group. So thanks so much. Thank you very much, Lars. Thank you.